Chrysler Corporation's new compact truck line is something all you master technicians should be interested in, even if your dealership isn't in the truck business. Here's why. Some of your best passenger car customers will probably use these compact trucks in their businesses, and you'll be seeing them in your service department. Besides, it makes good sense for every Chrysler Motors dealership to boost all our products. What's more, the better equipped our dealerships are to service all Chrysler-built vehicles, the better chance we have of maintaining owner loyalty. So let's join in while Ray tells Bill all about servicing this new line. Hi, fellas. Hi, Tech. Ray was just telling me that the compact truck comes in two other models besides this wagon. Right, Bill. The van model is ideal for light delivery service, like for florists, cleaners, and grocers. And it'll be just right for a lot of tradesmen, like the fellow who services your TV set. The pickup will see a lot of action in the building trades and among landscapers and farmers. And it's just the thing for dealerships to use for parts and light delivery. But make no mistake about this. These new compact service trucks aren't just compact passenger cars with truck bodies. Where passenger car components are used, they are heavy-duty or full-size passenger car components. In other words, our compact trucks are built to carry commercial loads. Here's something important to us technicians. Most of the service operations on these compact trucks can be handled with passenger car parts, passenger car tools, and passenger car know-how. Okay, where are you going to start with the service lesson, Ray? Well, let's start with the engine, Bill. There's nothing that should puzzle you here. The 170 cubic inch slant six engine is standard and the 225 cubic inch six is optional. I see, but say, aren't some of the engine accessories gonna be hard to get at for service? Not really, Bill. For instance, for ordinary under the hood checks, it's just as easy as lifting the hood. All you have to do to check the engine oil and radiator coolant is raise this hinged cover. Lifting the engine cover also lets you service the carburetor and air cleaner. With the cover raised, you also have access to the alternator, starter relay, and crankcase vent system. If the truck has an automatic transmission, the dipstick for that's right here, too. All right, but what about a tune-up? Nothing to it, lad. First, you just fold the right front seat forward. Just pull these two pins, and you can take the seat right out. With the seat tipped forward or removed, it's a cinch to remove the engine compartment side panel. With the right-hand side panel off, you can get at the engine ignition system, the spark plugs, distributor, and coil. You can also get at the fuel pump. Tune-up specs are just about the same as for cars, Bill. You'll find them in the new reference book. Thanks, Tech. Does the panel on the driver's side come off too, Ray? Sure does, Bill. The left-hand panel comes off the same way and lets you get at the manifolds, starter, and water pump. You service the oil filter and fuel filter from under the truck. And incidentally, you're not apt to be pulling an engine for a while, but when you do, the engine and transmission come out as a unit from underneath. While we're talking about underneath, Ray, let's show Bill the right way to raise this truck on a hoist. Okay, Tech. Never use a frame hoist on these jobs, Bill, or you'll damage the underbody structure. This unibody design has no frame or structural members designed for lifting. You can raise the truck with axle jacks or use a two-post hoist with a support under the axles. If the hoist won't adjust for this short wheelbase, use an angle iron across the front yoke of the hoist. The angle iron supports the truck under the end of the front spring right against the spring bracket. There are details on that in the reference book, Bill. Okay, Tech. Now, just how would I get the engine out with the truck way up in the air? A wooden cradle that sits on a hand truck makes removal safe and easy, Bill. Disconnect everything from the engine, except the mounts. Loosen the front insulator studs. Then lower the hoist so the engine is supported on the cradle. With the engine resting on the cradle, remove the front engine support brackets and disconnect the rear mount. Then raise the truck clear of the engine. It isn't quite that easy, Bill. There are some precautions to follow so you don't damage the fan, for instance. But if you follow the reference book instructions, you won't have any trouble. Okay, Tech. Say, isn't this a new kind of mount at the rear of the transmission? Sure is, Bill. And there's a special tool to remove and replace the rubber bushing in the eye on the mount. What's the story on transmissions? 
Well, you're already familiar with all the transmissions used in these trucks, Bill. The A903 three-speed manual is standard with the 170 cubic inch engine. The heavy-duty A745 manual transmission is standard with the 225 engine and optional with the 170 engine. The load flight automatic transmission used with either engine is a truck version of the big A727 heavy-duty torque flight. The shift control is a console type mounted on the instrument panel. That shift control is the same one used on 1964 Sport Fury and Polara 500. The shift cable adjustment is different from push-button models. You make the adjustment in manual low instead of reverse, and you pull out on the cable instead of pushing in. You'll find the details in the reference book. I'm with you, Tech. Now, how about this manual transmission shift linkage? The shift rod adjustments are most common, so let's talk about them first. As you can see, the swivels are at the transmission levers. These swivels make the rod adjustments easy because they're held by set screws instead of being screwed on. Be sure you always torque the screws right. 70 inch pounds. You want to be sure they'll hold but won't get stripped. The initial rod adjustment is to establish the correct position for the gear shift lever. Adjust the second high shift rod so the gear shift lever is horizontal when it's in neutral. Then adjust the low reverse shift rod to align the shift lever hub slots so the crossover pin doesn't bind. You can usually do this by feeling for smooth action as you move the shift lever from second high to low reverse and back. If you want to see the crossover pin, screw out the grease fitting and turn the retainer sleeve until the slot uncovers the pin. Better tell Bill about the crossover pin and travel adjustment too, Ray. Occasionally the U-bolt clamp gets out of position on the steering column, upsetting the crossover pin travel. Then the pin binds on one of the hubs and you have hard shifting, either into second and high or into low and reverse, depending on which way the travel is off. If that happens, loosen the clamp and slide it up or down to get 50 thousandths clearance between the crossover pin and the bottom of the slot in the second high shift lever hub. Tighten the clamp nuts to 110 inch pounds. Then be sure to recheck the clearance. The clamp may slip up or down during tightening. Of course, you won't have to make this adjustment often, but when you have hard shifting into two gears, always check out the crossover pin travel before you adjust the rods. And while I'm thinking about it, that needle is traveling along pretty close to the end of side one. So would somebody please arrange for it to cross over to start of side two? Is there anything special about the drive shaft, Ray? Nope, it's a one-piece shaft. You service the U-joints the same as passenger car U-joints. The differential is the big eight and three-quarter inch passenger car unit, Bill. It's available in anti-spin as well as the standard version. But there is something new out at the ends of the axle. This is the first U.S. or Canadian production vehicle to use both tapered roller bearings and flanged axle shafts. There are some big advantages to this new design. The tapered bearing life is up to eight times longer than the bearings our competitors use. Bearing adjustment is real easy. And here's the one I like best. Brake service is so much simpler. I sure agree with you there, Tech. You don't need a wheel puller to get the brake drums off. With the wheel removed, all you have to do is remove three speed nuts to pull the drum. Not that these brakes will need much servicing. They're the same reliable self-adjusting brakes we use on full-sized Plymouth and Dodge cars. And like our passenger cars, the rear wheel brakes also act as parking brakes. For parking, the shoes are actuated by a lever and strut. How about getting back on the subject of flanged axle shafts, Ray? Better tell Bill how to remove the axle shaft and bearing assembly. Okay, Tech. To remove the axle shaft, Take out the retainer nuts through the hole in the axle shaft flange. You can pull the shaft without disturbing the brakes or the parking brake strut. Here's how. Align the flat on the retainer with the parking brake strut. Tip the backing plate a little so the retainer clears the strut. Then you can pull the shaft right out. Be very careful when removing or handling the shaft so you don't nick or damage the shaft, particularly the inner seal surface. 
There is a special tool coming to remove and install a tapered roller bearing. You'll find detailed bearing removal instructions in the reference book. Right now, Ray, you better cover the highlights of reinstalling the axle shaft assembly and adjusting axle shaft end play. Well, before you reinstall the right hand shaft assembly, turn the adjuster until the inner face of the adjuster is flush with the inner face of the retainer. That'll make it easier to get the bearing and shaft assembly into place. When the assembly's in place, tighten the retainer nuts to 35 foot-pounds. Now, here's how you go about adjusting axle shaft end play. This adjuster on the right-hand side adjusts end play for both axle shafts. First, you tighten it until there's no end play. Then, back the nut off for 13 to 23 thousandths end play. Wrap the end of the left-hand shaft with a soft mallet to seat the cup and align the bearing. Then, recheck the end play. Finally, take off the retainer nut with a washer face and install the lock under it. Retighten the nut, 30 to 35 foot-pounds. Now, I'm itching to find out about that steering and front suspension. It doesn't look like anything I've ever worked on. <laughs> it might look strange to you, young fella, but there's nothing new to truck technicians or to old-time passenger car technicians either. Tech's right, Bill. This job has a solid I-beam front axle suspension with leaf springs. The wheel spindles are mounted on kingpins instead of ball joints. And that pickup you use on parts runs has the same kind of suspension. The steering gear is the worm and roller type. From the pitman arm, you steer through a drag link to the steering arm on the left wheel. The right wheel is steered by a tie rod connected to the left wheel. You adjust toe by turning the tie rod. That's simple enough. What about caster and camber? Camber is built into the kingpin bore in the axle, Bill. It'll never get out of adjustment unless the axle or steering knuckle is bent. Positive caster also is built into the axle. Caster can be adjusted, though, by shimming the axle, but it won't be necessary often. Speaking of caster, it's possible to install the axle end for end. Everything would fit, but when you got it back together, you'd end up with negative caster instead of positive. With negative caster, you'd have poor returnability and poor directional stability. How do I tell which is the right way to install the axle? No problem at all, lad. Just be sure the kingpin locking pins are at the front of the vehicle. Okay, I'll remember that. Now, how about the adjustments on the steering gear? There's an adjusting screw for the cross shaft preload, Bill. Worm bearing preload is set by shims at the gear end cap. All that good information is in the reference book, Bill. Now, let's set this baby down on the floor and look at some of the electrical equipment before we run out of time. Okay, Tech. Down she goes. Before we touch anything electrical, let's take that negative cable off the battery. Then I'll show you how to get at the instruments. First, disconnect the speedometer cable. Then, remove these four screws and lift the faceplate off the cluster. When you remove the faceplate, watch out you don't drop that glass. It's not plastic and it'll break. With the faceplate, glass, and sponge pad removed, you can roll the cluster back for service. For bench work, remove the electrical connections and lift the cluster right out. When you put the cluster back, always reinstall the sponge pad. It prevents the glass from rattling and keeps dirt out of the instruments. The radio dial is part of the faceplate, Bill. So when you're installing a radio, you set the pointer over to the end of the dial. Then you turn the tuning knob another eight turns to be sure the variable condenser is all the way over. I see, but how the dickens do you get the radio in and out with the heater there? Through the glove box opening, Bill. With the liner out, you've got plenty of room to remove the radio and the windshield wiper motor, too. Sorry to interrupt you, Ray, but we're running pretty close to the end of side two on that record, and we're going to have to sign off. There's a lot more to the compact truck story. You'll find it all in the new reference book. So be sure and study the reference book and keep it handy. That way you'll be prepared to take care of these new compact trucks when they come into your shop for service.